My name is Corey Messinger. I'm a senior design build manager with Excel Construction. I'm also similar to Jessica, continuing the thread of Penn State alumni um, talking today. Uh, also Penn State alumni that have moved to the West Coast. Um, so uh, with Excel Construction, we're out here in the Bay Area in Northern California. And uh, it's a general contractor that's very much focused on integrated uh, projects and delivery uh, models. So we do a lot of same at risk. We do design build, especially progressive design build. And I wanted to talk a little bit today about conditions of satisfaction and kind of maybe taking a um, different approach with putting them together. Um, this is something I've struggled with over the years and I'm not sure if you guys have run down in um, this journey in the past. Um, and so today I wanna to kind of talk a little bit about what conditions of satisfaction are or at least how you know, I've approached it or how I've seen it. Um, and then how does that potentially apply if you take that model and start to apply an OKR approach? And we'll talk a little bit about what OKRs are. Um, so starting off with conditions of satisfaction and the importance of conditions of satisfaction. Um, I had a project recently where, you know, we thought it was a fairly straightforward one. We came in at the end of design development um, engaged with a, it was a design build project. We inherited the design team that had been working on this project for about five years and thought it was straightforward. We'll pick up the design where it is, carry it through completion. Easy peasy. As we got into the project, we found very quickly that the client's goals and aspirations for the project changed. And through that change, we went from a full build out and, um, taking a very mature design to dialing it back to what is the barest essential we need to do to meet several obligations, lease terms, um, permitting, um, and uh, basic, basic meeting of occupancy, which was a really big dynamic for the team. And so that goal setting process, we set forward with them and it took us a couple of months. Sometimes you're just, you're still in that honeymoon phase with the project. And you're thinking like, okay, everything was clear, clear RFP, clear pre, um, clear discussions as part of the, the pursuit and pre-sale. This is, you know, we know what's here ahead of us. And then when you actually get the project, and I'm sure this has happened no, to nobody else, but once you get that project, all of a sudden you start to see kind of what's hiding behind the, um, in the layers of the onion, if you will. And so that goal setting process, you know, we've looked at it very hard as kind of our day one activity. Um, and so once we've, we've been awarded a job, doesn't matter what we've learned in that pre-sale, sitting down with that team, um, the owner, our design partners, um, our team together and going through this is really critical to the success of the project. And it's helps to get that before we get too far into the project to really kind of have those conversations while it's still fresh with everyone. And before we, more importantly, have burned a lot of time and energy and capital going down the wrong path of the project and finding out this is not really what the owner wanted or these are not important things to the owner. And sometimes that is, an, and we found is those maybe early seeds in terms of topics. We found sometimes these are very mature things and things that have been lurking behind the scenes that they've wanted to bring forward, but because of the RFP process and so forth, they necessarily haven't. Um, or that they have thought about, but they didn't realize the importance of getting that down um, into a manageable form. And so from that process, and I apologize if you, you guys have already been down this road a bit, um, but you know we feel it's really important getting that project goal um, established, high level, low level, developing the criteria to support that goal, and then really getting into a situation where you're testing and course correcting um, to work your way into uh, that final project and ultimately getting to what the client's going to view as successful. What are you guys going to view as successful as a design, design partner, as a general contractor, as potentially a stakeholder downstream? What are those things that are going to make this, this project successful? Um, and sometimes that changes. Um, a lot of times that's very fluid, but to be able to at least get that baseline and that framework established to be able to, to stay and kind of swim um, in that general direction until you're, you're eventually dialing into the final targets. So from a project performance standpoint, that ability to understand those parameters before you start meeting with users, that ability as you're starting to develop 
your estimates, as you're developing your schedules, as you're looking at um, where you're going to put your resources is really key. Um, that may inform your initial programming for the project. It may inform conceptual directions. You may find out thinking that you're going in at a very high end on a project and finding out that the owner really is looking for uh, more of a give me a great lobby and a great bathroom and give me adequate space to be able to get tenants in at the end of the day. So tailoring this is, is going to help with that efficiency piece of it. It's also starting to help get out through those conversations and that social object that you're creating through this process, that ability to understand what are the kind of the, the risks that the team is seeing as well and starting that conversation. So it's starting to create that risk register kind of in parallel to that as you're starting to see and understand what's really key to making this product successful. LCI has a Great description. I think this this paragraph has always been something um, that I've pulled out and gone back to for conditions of satisfaction is that understanding that ultimately it's a commitment from the team in terms of what we're going to try to shoot for and deliver as a project. You know, it's about reliable promising. And but it can also touch on many things. It can be stakeholder targets. What are the environmental goals? Um, is this building looking for something from a building performance standpoint? Are we going for, you know, are we going for lead silver or are we going for net zero? Um, how does that client want themselves to be seen or what are the goals that they have um, aspirationally for themselves? Is it financial constraints? Is it schedule constraints? Um, are there things that, well, we, we said we like it here, but we really would love to get it to here and can we do that? So picking apart those things that can be a wide ranging componentry that goes together to ultimately, and it's gonna vary, client by client, project by project in terms of what those important pieces are. The goal itself, um, this was a, a thing I actually pulled out um, years ago when I was doing work in Moscow. Um, we were dealing with a project where we were ultimately delivering the first um, US style suburban office building uh, to Russia. And from that standpoint, we were trying to understand in a whole new market, what are those critical pieces, um, the must haves versus the should have or would like to haves, that what is committed, that's gonna be very essential for the project. And then if we can get here, great, this is, this is icing on the cake, if you will. And then understanding through that, you know, what are, as we were talking about, okay, so we wanna do X, how do we measure that? And a lot of times that's, that's been a big hang up that I've seen in, in traditional kind of conditions of satisfaction is it can be something sometimes very aspirational and ethereal. You know, um, it could be more of something like a vision statement per se that we're starting to define several of them, but how do we really know that we've achieved it or how do we track that? And is it, in some cases, is it already baked into our contract that we must deliver this? Um, or have we even looked at our contract deep enough to understand we have some of these key parameters? You know, a classic one is um, looking at environmental um, requirements, um, looking at your um, CEQAs and so forth to be able to understand what is that uh, piece that the team has already previously committed. Maybe it's buried in there, but has to be pulled forward based on what this is trying to do. And getting through this, and often I've seen these in narrative formats. I've seen it as Here's five bullet points up on a wall. These are the things we want to get to, but how do we get there? So that directionality starts to fold into this. So we've got goals up here, but how do we know that the team is moving in those goals? Consistency, how do we know that from the standpoint of um, success, is what this person is seeing as successful on the same exact goal as this person, how do we measure that? How do we say, yes, we have achieved X when it can be very relative, highly relative um, or and subjective in terms of what those individuals may be looking at to be able to measure and say, yes, we've hit that mark. Often we've had projects where we've gone down that road. The team is like, yes, we've hit it all. And then you talk to the owner, it's like, eh, I, I was kind of expecting a little bit more, a little bit push further. Um, and to get to this point, and that's really what's going to affect our business case at the end of the day, um, to be able to say that operationally, this is fantastic. 
and then ultimately the accountability in this. And how are those goals, those five bullet points on the wall, who is tracking those? Who is taking on saying, I'm responsible for successfully delivering this goal or working through what it's going to take for this goal? And how am I reporting out and checking in and making sure that we're doing this? You know, often with conditions of satisfaction, we see goals that are over the course of the project. And from that standpoint, it might be, we're going to deliver a leading class hospital, maybe a condition of satisfaction, okay? So what does that mean? What is, and who is going to do that? The great, the whole team, fantastic. But who within the team is taking that ownership to say, yes, this we're meeting those marks and we're progressing it in this way to get to there ultimately. And so kind of looking at these factors, um, I recently took a step back and said, well, is there a better way? Is there a more accountable way we can do this? And so that started to pull me back into the agile world and looking at an OKR. So an OKR is, uh, for those of you that have been involved in the tech industry, um, is highly relevant today. Um, often, you know, Google, Facebook, um, they're using these, Intel are using these to be able to lay out that course and roadmap for subprojects and projects to be able to have trackable measurable statistics and goals for those project teams. Um, and so using that to be able to progress um, many projects at a time and understanding where they're at and what they're trying to achieve and boiling this down to a key result. This was something originally Andy Grove started it back in Intel. Um, it was picked up by John Doerr and John Doerr um, for those of you that don't know, you've probably have seen a lot of his work. He's, he's uh, with Kleiner and Perkins, um, the investment firm, and for many years. And he had his hand in, um, at Apple when they were first starting. Um, many of the tech companies, um, as they were growing, um, being in there, looking at their operations, being a key investor, and helping to bring a lot of the technology that we're using today uh, to the forefront. And so as he was going through this process, he was starting to see some of the, the same challenges. You know, how am I looking at an investment here and how am I weighing that and what can be done to help improve that process? And so a few years ago, he came out with um, Measure What Matters. And it's, it's, it's an easy read, um, not, not a big book, um, but it helps kind of understand that thought process around uh, looking at kind of managing your goals, managing your expectations and trying to get to how to um, ultimately come out of this with metrics. And metrics that you can ultimately say you're getting to 100, you're getting to 70%, you're getting to 50% to be able to come back to that, that goal setting. Um, I am going to apologize. I don't have my chat up right now. So if any questions are coming in the chat, I'm not necessarily seeing it. So I apologize. Um, so with the objectives and key results, and how, how does this start to get to a goal is a pretty simple sentence. I will do X by, and, and this will be measured by Y effectively. And then once you take this simple statement, you can start to break it down and look at it in a few various different ways to be able to ultimately understand what will it take to get to X and how are those metrics? Is it a single metric or multiple metrics that you're using to look at how that's gonna be viewed as successful? And what do those metrics mean ultimately at the end of the day? So taking one of these, and kind of breaking it apart. You know, a classic one on the construction side is, you know, our goal at the end of the day as a general contractor is to make sure every single person on our project through the life of the project gets home safely. We do not want any injuries. We don't want any casualties. Um, we want ideally zero recordables. Um, you know, we have clients that this is mandatory for. Um, and so looking at this, so let's say our objective is to, we want to guarantee, and we have a client that is looking at worker safety, zero tolerance safety. And so we wanna make sure all contractors are getting home safe. So the key result of that is number one is zero project reportables. Um, so that means we are getting to a point where we can look at a log at the end of the day and look at a list and as a target, we have no safety reportables on paper. And so from that, that standpoint, we can start to say, okay, there's, there's a measurable outcome. And so part of the conversation then becomes is, okay, so if we get one, if we get 10, what does that mean and how does that impact the project and, our, and 
the overall um, process to be able to look at how are we meet, one is it meeting the goal? Is it a stretch goal? Is it a very real goal? The next layer down from metric is are we doing a consistent orientation to the safety requirements and goals of the project with every single person that's coming on the job site? Are we closing the gap to say, you're coming on, oh, we didn't, we didn't inform you, we didn't run, take you through this process. And is it achievable to be able to say, hundred before you step on the job site, every single person on the project will go through this. And so that is a very real goal to say, yes, yes, this is a requirement of work to be out here. As we start stepping down through though, we can say, okay, so in the next layer of this, every day as we're doing our safety huddles, what's important, what's trending, do we have a heat, heat hazard index that we need to worry about today? Do we have a condition on site that we need to orient people around from a workflow standpoint or a new condition that may affect their work? Can we get everybody there? Well, if somebody comes in late and they've missed that huddle, if it's super uh, somebody coming on um, later in the day, just timing and stuff, maybe there might be a couple of misses in that, but 98%, you know, is that a very real goal? And our stretch goal would be 100%, but 98%, you know, we feel that is doable as a team. And then taking that one step further and saying to make sure everybody's safe, are we looking at the jobs that they're doing and before they do a new task, are they doing a job hazard analysis? Are they sitting there and going through, I'm doing this, this is what I need to do, this is the safety risk and assessing that with each new activity that they're starting and are we monitoring and tracking that? So we're starting to get really down to the team level each day of work as a goal, we'd love to get 100%, 95%, we should be covering all those conditions and as a, as a real target we can hit and strive for as a team. So now we have something we can come back to. And as we start to look at this each week, to, to, we can look at the trending, we can start to look at this weekly, we can start to look at this monthly. We can understand how the team as a whole is doing. And that top one, that key indicator of zero project safety reportables really everything is kind of boils up to that. If we start to get, if we do get a recordable, why did that happen? We start to do five whys, we can start to dig into these processes and that we can also come back and course correct as necessary once we've had this condition. If, if we get to a point where we say, okay, we've had an incident. Okay, so what do we do? How do we readjust and, and make sure we're re reiterating that goal or do we need to reevaluate what that, what that goal is? So coming out of this then, we can then start to go one layer deeper and start to look at our initiatives that are supporting this. So do we have clear contract requirements? Do we have orientation um, and requirements clearly outlined that this is a must do before anybody does any work? Do we have a sign-in process? So we have that accountability and we can verify that, hey, whoever is out there, you're sitting through this and we can come back and, and measure it and we can follow up those people that aren't, aren't there. And similarly, do we have a training program for how to properly do the job hazard analysis? And we might even have another bullet point for properly going out and checking on that regularly. So we have check-ins and course correction as necessary if people aren't doing this correctly um, or we're finding that it's slipping. So you can start to build off of a single item, a more structured approach to be able to say, all of these things are leading up to that goal, that one of the five bullet points on the wall. This is how we're doing this. And then we can start to assign and look at who's responsible for this. Is it our safety manager? Is it uh, the project manager overall? Who is that point of accountability to, that's gonna be verifying and making sure this is happening and this is working and they're managing this process to success. So with that goal process, it's also kind of creating a bi-directional component here. Um, in the last presentation, um, uh, talking about ASA Abloy's process, you know, they were talking about uh, tribes and clans and so forth. As you start to go up and down, you're looking at the ability to, for with this process now, for your client and the team leadership to really define the objectives together. And then going, taking that back to the team is, this is how we'll do this to meet this. And so you're getting this flow and course and ability to have a conversation around your conditions of satisfaction now as two-way as opposed to something that was defined by a handful of people in a room that all of a sudden this poster arrives at. And it's an ongoing conversation. 
And ultimately that social object through that conversation allows for really the inquisitive, inquisitive, inquisitive nature to be able to look at that initiative and, or that goal. And if this is a must do to meet it, you're having that regular check-in process. And this can parallel as well with your risk management workshops and so forth through the project to really evaluate regularly, how are we doing with this? And do we need to look at it a different way? Is this still relevant? You know, in some cases we may have already met this. This may be something, you know, by the end of schematic design, we've met the goal. Um, or it may be something that is a long-term piece and it is going to take a lot of time because maybe it's something that you won't be able to really say we've met it until the very end of the project. So with that then is also that ability to look at once you start taking that goal and you have your initiatives, you can start to also look at the risk and mitigation, which, you know, they're very symbiotic back and forth as a risk comes up. So going back to the safety example, for instance, and saying, well, we know that we have a, we are gonna have a high turnover of contractors on this project because of market conditions or so forth. How can we affect that mitigation? That mitigation may be looking at increasing safety manager requirements on the project. That may be looking at our education process. That may be really a very managed solution and often it's a very managed solution or it could be, we need to do X to make sure we hit Y. And so that effect can go back and forth. And sometimes it may be finding out the mitigation isn't enough. That may be finding out the risk maybe isn't as high as we thought it was. But at least having that conversation regularly, and this, this then can marry off and go over to your risk register um, to at a high level of the risk register to say, we're looking at these, and this is how we're doing at, at a high level risk piece as you're going down through other risk limit projects and keeping that out in the forefront. In terms of cadence of this, you know, there, it, it kind of brings out a big question. And, and often with lean, we get hit by the, how much overhead, how much maintenance, how are we meeting too much? Are we meeting not enough? And so in the, this case, you could say yes to both extremes. Um, you know, are you going to get enough data on a daily basis to be able to say, yes, we're doing this. And if you have a very short sprint, maybe, but most likely you're looking at kind of a weekly to monthly cadence to be able to see and have enough data to say, you know, we're doing okay. We're moving this, we're moving the ball along. We're doing, we're progressing it in a positive way or, or we're seeing a risk coming up that we need to sit down and talk about and have some time to course correct. In terms of waiting till project completion, you've started your five bullet points on the wall and then you did that at the beginning of the project, you stuck that up on the wall, you just received substantial completion, you go over and look at the five points and then said, oh, well, we didn't meet this, we didn't meet this, kind of met this. You don't have any time to recover in that process by just waiting until the end of the project to go back and revisit it. And so figuring out somewhere in a more kind of managed milestone piece, what is your operational side, and then what's your strategic um, check-in for that. And so you may operationally be looking at the safety program as an example, again, on a weekly basis. You may be looking at a goal of, we wanna make sure we have positive city engagement on a project. That may be a more, more on a monthly basis where you're looking at how you're engaging with the city. Have we met with them? How, what's the feedback? How are we course correcting? They love it, great. That may be an ongoing conversation happening, you know, with a much greater interval between. And then quarterly or annually is taking that step back as a team and ideally collectively with the owner and um, the overall project leadership and really going, if we step back to these goals and, the, and what's going to make this successful, where are we at with the stretch goals and say, okay, high level, we're, we're seeing this trend data, we're seeing the, where this is going maybe your project restraints have changed. Maybe your program has changed. Market conditions, we've had an amazing year of high escalation and if holding within a very specific budget to meet a specific program was key. That may be something that after a couple months, you have to just say this quarter, we're just gonna focus on how do we get back to this and what are those key factors that are gonna make this successful based on this condition? or even annually doing a, a big for a 10 year project, maybe your points come back together as a leadership team and say, how are we doing? And, and really doing that, that deep dive back on that. 
annually it's often a little bit too long of a gap, but you know, that is something based on, you know, if you have a very long-term project to, it may be helpful to go back and, and just as a team have that conversation as a workshop. So how does this start to look then when you take an, and break apart a project? So at your project start, sitting down as a team and developing that baseline of conditions. And that would look at, and you want to go deep with that. And because that's going to help to start to pull forward some of the challenge, it's going to pull some forward some of the opportunities through that and help to identify as well the timing of it. Um, you may have something that's not even going to be an effect until construction. You may have something that is going to be done, needs to happen, you know, by the end of schematic or engaging an agency. So your different milestones and so forth, getting that out you know, and that could be very much a few hours, it could be a day. Sometimes it may be something where you start it and then come back over a few weeks to, to work through that, um, to build that out and, and have a chance for feedback through that process. Just because ultimately we're going for durable decision that we don't wanna go back and be really wishy-washy about. This, is, this, is, this can be very, very important things to the project. So that major milestone, you know, that might be, at each phase, if you're on a quarterly phase, if you're doing a, a design process where every three months you have a major milestone, going back in at the end of DD, going back in at the end of CDs, how are we doing with these pieces and doing that kind of audit, if you will, um, and team huddle, it may be, you know, planned out if you're on a shorter project, let's get to midpoint of design, end of design, midpoint construction, end of construction. So that's the big audits. And then you start to look at what's the cadence um, that you're doing those smaller check-ins on this. And this could be just a small huddle with your leadership team. This could be meeting with those that are leading those sub-initiatives, having them come in and talk about and understand and assess where you may stand at this. If you're looking at building energy envelope performance is a must have criteria for this because of you know, very strong company goals around um, uh, sustainability, environmental, uh, requirements, you may have your whole skin and envelope team focused on that along with your, your MEP team. And so those check-ins become very key very early on to make sure you've got that criteria. And as you engage new players into that process, you're sprinting and, and onboarding them and validating that you're hitting this. And those sprints then start to look at, you know, they could be a two week, they could be a four week in between those milestones that based on either how your trend data is or the time is coming in that we really need to focus on this because it's that relevant time to look and, and then really step into a sprint mindset where the next four weeks or the next eight weeks, we're focused on this and building that game plan. And you may have an interim check-in on that sprint or that may be your termination of that sprint to give you those milestones to work through. You know, um, I'm an architect by background um, and not speaking for all architects, but you know, we were trained very much as uh, uh, deadline driven individuals and that sprint deadline coming into one of these milestones when you have pressure of an executive review at the end of it, it it can be motivating so helping to try to give that incentive in there to be able to 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 have that work point to go to and to round this out then is and this is i wanted to start a little bit simple with the group here but how you start to look at trans, uh, tra transition this into a metric uh, documented metric so this is a sample from a project, names have been hidden to um, protect the innocent, but the looking and starting with that objective and looking and thinking about it from a standpoint, is this a must have objective or is this a should have? That committed um, goal versus this is an aspirational goal. And that aspirational goal may have a high likelihood that it could fail. I mean, a good uh, stretch goal, you know, Google refers to them as moonshots they may be pushing the boundaries to get there and ultimately the team you know with our owner in hand may go we've looked we've investigated we've pushed this we don't think we can get there can we dial it back to an, a, a more managed goal at some point but we've we've pushed that we've pushed that boundary in other cases when you have those must-have goals this is critical for the success and operations of the building um, and that client at the end of the day and this could be in some cases, this may be a life or death situation in terms of safety. This may be something about that really affects their business case um, at the end of the day. And so like in this case, that student experience for a school, huge. They wanna make sure at the end of the day, 
the students are engaged into the process, they're happy with it. That is their ultimate measure of success for the, the programming of this building. What are the results then that are coming out of that? In some cases, if you look at this, you know, you may be able to put numbers on it and talk through that. What does this mean if we get 75% student engagement in our user meetings that, okay, so three quarters of our user meetings at the end of the day, we can come back and say, we've had students in those meetings and giving feedback to the process at the end of the day. You know, if this was 25% versus 100%, where does this fall in it? And there is a level of relativity in there, um, but that's part of the discussion, the negotiation is, what do we feel is ultimately at the end of the day, can they commit to? And that we feel we're gonna get the value out of. And in this case, three quarters of those meetings, we feel like we're getting enough input and buy-in through the student body. And we can, and we can as a, collectively as a team say, we've gotten the input from the students. You know, another case, you know, looking at identifying three locations for art murals, a little bit lower priority in terms of, um, you know, from a medium standpoint, but we want to have that something there visible to be able to say that we, we really have brought the students into the process and they have a place to display themselves uh, within this. And then looking at this at the other end of the spectrum, and from the timing standpoint, we, we located a slow, it will increase in um, priority as we get closer to the end of the project, but right now is identifying at the end of the day, we want feedback from the students once they move in. How do they feel about this? Is there anything we need to do to adjust and learn from this? And so that timetable and status then starts to come into play in addition to the accountability of the champion. Um, often we have, we'll do this directly with a name individual, or if we're a big enough project and we're doing clusters, that cluster will be assigned here. So this may be an interior team that is identified for, for some of this in lieu of the architects. Um, it may be our lead designer taking this on. Are we running on track? Do we determine we can't quite achieve that? Um, and just from a space standpoint, I have this cut off here, but part of the notes over on the side is, hey, based on our space here, we can only get two. And having that conversation, we had that conversation with the owner and they're fine. You know, they feel that that's still bringing, bringing enough value to them and they understand the spatial constraints on this small building. So, Looking at this as well and starting to say, you know, in our should territory, we have a risk here based on con market conditions and feedback that we may not get all of our um, deferred approval uh, scopes bought in early. And so this is then also bringing into that, that component with the risk register of having the conversation, how critical is this? So can we manage around this with DSA? And in our case, we felt, yes, we can, um, based on those particular trades and having that negotiation and ultimately coming to a new consensus for where we wanna target. So the next thing kind of thinking about this and, and as you get into this is then starting to think about how, is there a spot on here where you're actually getting the team to do their own self-assessment, those champions that are leading this to identify where they feel that they're trending and adding that trend data on here. So you can start to see, and they're, they're providing that two-way bi-directional loop back into this to really look at themselves and say, okay, yeah, I think maybe, maybe we're about a tenth of the way through. Maybe I give myself, a, you know, a 30% or, you know, I feel like I'm knocking out of the park and you can have that conversation with them about why and how and, and is everyone aligned with that in terms of percentage of progress and how they're doing with that initiative. Um, and are there any sub-initiatives underneath of this that you're tracking and how do those timing wise and how this factor in, in terms of similar kind of risk with each of those or additional information and kind of building up the tool as you like it. There are some great online tools for this, um, web-based tools that are free like Asana, Monday.com, uh, a quick OKR search will give you a bunch of options there. That, and a lot of them now are starting to sync up with the project management tools that are available out online. Um, so really quickly here, I know we're kind of running up on time and I don't want to keep anybody into their lunch. Um, so some, a couple of quick lessons learned. Um, stretching is healthy um, for the body, the mind, the soul, and for the team. Um, so looking at this from the standpoint that as you start to create opportunities for stretch goals, it is going to uh, stress the team. I think James earlier had a great point. Teams operate amazingly under stress and creating those opportunities with stretch goals to really think outside the box, to push the team and really kind of add a little bit of additional pressure to try to um, achieve something that they may not have achieved otherwise.
um, don't boil the ocean. Um, so in respect to that is try not to set goals that are so overarching that it becomes such a massive undertaking that it's not achievable. Break this down, you know, take the whale or into bite-sized pieces and start to think about how, how do we chip away in this? And so you may have a few more goals, but that initiative could still be a meaningful size, but you really have to kind of look at your structure, substructures under that and say, okay, the number of targets we have, and then maybe you're getting a little bit meatier in the initiatives, or is this multiple initiatives that are, are multiple goals that are kind of boiling up into one bigger target. So you can mentally and responsibly take into account that accountability and structure and how you trend this together. Um, and the last one, um, you know, I think this goes well for woodworking. It also goes well here is as you think about those metrics, taking a step back and say, and really kind of questioning at times those metrics and, you know, is this metric really bringing value? And asking that a couple of times. And then, you know, at times you may cut those metrics out and say this, you know, the more I'm thinking about it, it might be a binary, binary thing. We've achieved it or we have it. It may be something that you can put granularity on it. But at least having that conversation and understanding as a team why that that is important and, and ultimately all this is is doing is mining the team and the leadership for what is really key to this project so at the end of the day that they feel like they can push this up forward so i think with that and from a time standpoint i think we're about there so uh any questions thoughts comments and thank you Great job, Corey. Any questions? Corey, I, I have a few questions. Um, who takes who takes the lead in setting up that spreadsheet that you had there? You showed the what, when, how, who. And I, I got two other questions, maybe you can listen. So for objective number one, once it was decided, when it was concluded that it was not achievable, then does the whole team then talk to owner um, and tell them that it's not achievable? Yeah, um, so I think first on your question about who, the who, um, I would put that as a design, as a, sorry, not as a design, as a team question based on your structure um, <laughs> to champion this. If it is a, um, more of a conventional contract where, and by that, that sense, I mean, it's, it's more of a three-party contract where you may be separated. Um, you may have an owner, a design team and, and the contractor that um, it may, it may be a joint team and a representative from each that sits down and takes the initiative and is gonna manage this process. If you may be in an IPD project as you may have a lean champion on that team, or you may have a lead, somebody in one of the leadership positions that says, I'm, I'm gonna take this on. And their job, though, will be to have that negotiation and those conversations with the team and help champion to facilitate this to be developed. Um, ideally, this is not really ever developed by a single individual, because, again, this is the value of this is coming into that conversation that you're having with those individuals to understand. And so you may have a facilitator to this, um, but you may all but ultimately you want to kind of be doing this as a group document. Um, in terms of this, then, when you were asking about this item here about the art murals, this was something that, as we looked at it as a team internally, so this was one of this is a design build project. The DBE really dug deep into this, and as we were going, you know, we pulled in our CM, had a conversation with them. We ultimately took it up to the executive team, and it was with Cohen uh, hand in hand with the executive team that we talked about it and said, you know, this is this is what we have. We can do some things that maybe are more impactful in terms of redesign to create those spaces, or these are the two areas that we have. Now they're high value spaces that they're, 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 those opportunities are in. And so they said, okay, great. We can, we can work with those. Let's not go through a massive replanning exercise to create these additional opportunities. So um, you wanna have that. I mean, ultimately think about your escalation tree on the, on the project. Think about the stakeholders and, and how do you, as you change that status, you want to be having leadership buy-in as a, as a group, collective group into this, um, because this is really a shared document amongst the team. It, this kind of a commitment contract, if you will. Thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Great job.